know, so Aww. there it is. <laughs> nice. Just, so do you work with other folks in your shop or? Oh yeah, I work with uh, Loic uh, Borto from Bushro Guitar. He's oh, yeah, just in the background there. Oh, we just chatted last week. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> I didn't realize you guys worked alongside each other. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We met a few years ago and been working together for five years now. So. Okay. Awesome. Very cool. Well, I mean, I guess we'll just like launch right into it since you're a new luthier to uh, to Teaneg. I'd love to just hear a bit more about your um, your experience going from Switzerland through the cabinet making program, or I guess a program or sort of education, and then ending up in Quebec. Yeah. Well, actually, cabinet making was a part of my transition to guitar making since the beginning, mm -hmm. as I did want to become a guitar maker for a few years before and I decided to take a class in cabinet making just to have some basics about woodworking, uh, knowing how the wood reacts and how to work with the tools and everything. So I thought it was like the right way to do so. Mm -hmm. Started there, took the four-year program in Geneva, Switzerland. Then uh, when I graduated uh, in uh, 2014 i think yeah 2014 i moved to quebec city and started the the straight at the autumn at the national lottery school in uh in quebec city so it was a part of the the process i planned to to yeah. go through cabinet making first interesting was there a reason why you decided to do that instead of just jumping straight into luthery um i felt more com uh, it, it, well literally seemed to me like a huge mountain I couldn't climb straight up so I had to prepare it was kind of my <laughs> training let's say yeah so uh, I learned a lot and I'm pretty glad I did so because it really helped me with uh, from my design to the way I work with wood mm -hmm. in every aspect of it uh, really helped me so yeah uh, it, it was really part of my process and yeah, learned a lot from cabinet making, uh, also finishing, so. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a lot of, of European luthiers kind of go through a similar process. Like I know, I think Nick Huber did. Um, yeah, it just seems to be kind of a common thing, which I, I mean, I get that it makes a lot of sense and to have that sort of be almost like your fallback in a way, like you get to have that training and then you do have a like a job that you could do while you pursue yeah. this more like sort of ethereal, beautiful thing. So that's, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah so that was kind of, sorry yes but that was kind of the rational thinking too i had yeah. like let's say if i have to fall back as you say i would have something still in wood working so right exactly um so so you knew that you wanted to eventually end up in guitar making even before you started the cabinet making so was that because you'd been playing for a long time and you just knew that you really wanted to build instruments or how did you how what was your i guess your musical journey that side of it yeah uh I don't come from a musician family, so I started guitar with a teacher when I was seven, mm -hmm. and I never really performed it. I can play it well, but like never was a, a huge great player. And as time was going, I decided I needed to know more about the the guitar, more than just play it, but how it works how it was made so i started going uh, on my free saturdays to uh, uh olympia in uh, in the area where i lived at the time and started there did a few repairs just watching him working and then yeah that decided me to 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 take the step and i decided that time i knew i did I needed to know more about the guitar than just playing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, very cool. Um, and so that was where you sort of got the the seed of like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to take this even farther. That's where that was planted. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it started. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. say. So um, for your style of guitars that you make, um, do you feel like music has influenced your choices or do you sort of think about it more in terms of who you're making the guitars for and like what styles of players you're making for well in the first place i design the the, the models i build today and uh, all my my building today still are designed in the way that i enjoy 
what I deliver in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, I always work with the musician, but yeah, uh, I, I started with, yeah, trying to do something I would love to play, mm -hmm. which, yeah, put the, the basic of, uh, of the choices I made at the time and still today. So I wasn't a huge, uh, I, I didn't know a lot about finger style playing before I started uh, building guitar and when I discovered it I really decided to go for this kind of play because mm -hmm. uh, in the end that's the that's what I play today when I take a guitar yeah. and yeah really love the the way it can bring all the the parts of a song together and really amplify it kind of so yeah yeah i think loic and i were talking about how with fingerstyle guitar it's just you're sort of really putting the guitar through all of its paces whereas if it's just a rhythm guitar it's kind of just doing one job but with fingerstyle you get to it needs to do so many things because it is the only instrument in a lot of cases so there's a lot to explore there yeah but yeah at the, i went through a lot of phases from metal to suffer rock to to rap hip hop r and I, I have a lot of influences but when it comes to building guitars i i lay to the the, the finger style music mm -hmm. and nice so do you have um a lot of favorites in terms of finger style guitarists well uh i'm lucky enough to live in quebec city so there are a lot of amazing guitarist uh, living here or in Montreal and also coming by. So yeah, uh, Andy McKee is one of my favorite, even if he's not in Quebec City really, but uh, Antoine Dufour too. Mm -hmm. we, have the, we have the chance to have him in the city so we can see him perform frequently. Uh, John Gum is a huge inspiration. I discovered him a few years ago, playing with Don Ross at the time in Quebec City. Okay. Don Ross too is a... Yeah. Uh, uh, an incredible musician but for the finger style part i would say yeah the these name mm -hmm. i'm a huge fan of queen which is out of the finger style <laughs> and my and my biggest regret is to be born in uh, 1992 so <laughs> never had, never had the chance to see them perform but yeah yeah awesome cool well let's talk a little bit more about the guitars well your guitars in general but also the ones that you specifically sent us because these are absolutely gorgeous and this Sapelli OM is just like, it's so loud. I like just like sitting down to play it. I'm like, whoa, this does not sound like an OM at all. It's crazy. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, what do you do? Do you do anything different in terms of your bracing style or anything that people would be able to sort of like interpret into their understanding of, of the guitar? Uh, well, I, I, re I redesigned the, the bracing on the OM model, which is the second model I designed. Uh, uh, in the same with the same idea as I did for the Grand Auditorium, uh, which is uh, the traditional X brace, but uh, instead of the fingers beside the the, the X brace, uh, I had a fan with three bars and a transversal. Okay. So I feel like it really helps to balance the sound and make the the the, the top more not more reactive but like more balanced in the way it will vibrate according to the to the to the strings and everything so yeah i i, I redesigned kind of the the the, the classic x bracing and and pretty happy with the results so i i just like adapted it to the to the om shape which i redraw to so cool awesome and then, so I've never seen like Sapelli or Mahogany used on the fretboard like that. Was that a just kind of like a stylistic choice or was there a, like a playing responsive choice with that? A uh, bit of both actually. This Sapelli is uh, for the fingerboard is the same as I used for the back and side. Mm -hmm. And I had this huge lug of Sapelli uh, I used for just reinforcement parts for years. And I suddenly realized I could use it for Back and sides and it was already too late i had one back and side left <laughs> for this but the, the, this sapelli was uh, exceptionally dense compared to uh, traditional sapelli okay it was as dense as indian rosewood so i felt comfortable using it for the fingerboard without re risking the the, the the stability of it and getting it to just cave down so okay. 
I had the 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 chance to use the last piece of it to, to make a guitar <laughs> instead of reinforcement and uh, <laughs> nice yeah that's it's beautiful and um, I love that you did the the black uh, neck I feel like I've only ever seen that on Mario Beauregard's guitars but it's such a cool touch especially contrasted with like the Sapelli coloring so beautiful yeah and that was the 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 end goal of it it was to make that flashy contrast uh, from yeah. the, the brownish sapery to the very dark neck. Yeah. And so the this Maple Grand Auditorium, another so beautiful, so like, it's big, but it's not super, it's not like overwhelmingly huge, but it definitely has that big sort of almost like jumbo like sound, especially with, with Maple. So was this just sort of like, just going for the classic sort of approach with this one or anything special? Oh, this one was a was a tricky one. Actually, it came <laughs> from uh, I did a ukulele, which is like the exact same instrument as it, because my ukulele shape is designed. I took the grand auditorium shape and shrinked it to fit the needs of a tenor ukulele. Oh, really? And I did a ukulele with the same wood for the top, back, neck. Everything is the same. Also, the brass inlay, mm -hmm. uh, and I did want to work with metal for years since I spoke with the late Tom Dower uh, in uh, the Artisan Guitar Show a few years ago. And I love the way he worked with metal and uh, silver. And I started working with brass on the ukulele because I didn't want to, to go that far on the guitar at the beginning. Yeah. And yeah, because it's really tricky, all the inlays working with brass is completely different from working with wood so yeah. I had to, to I, I tried it on the ukulele and I decided to make a grand auditorium which would be the it, well actually it came as a pair at the beginning so both were identical with the same wood the same inlays everything was identical and I ended up with the guitar you have now so cool. yeah that's really neat yeah I, I love the so is, is that brass on this one too it just yeah. looks like gold colored okay yeah, that's so beautiful. But that's, yeah, you don't see that a lot. So that's pretty difficult to work with. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my, <laughs> I had to sharpen my tools so many times. Like uh, <laughs> every time I, I, I had to cut the meters on every inlay of this guitar and I did it with the end chisel. And yeah, <laughs> every every cut was like damaging the blade and I had to, 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 to sharpen it every, every 30 minutes just to keep going. Oh, geez, that's crazy. Wow. So in terms of like your aesthetics, I feel like, and I think I talked about this with Louis too, that there's like almost this cohesion, like you're like a lot of the, the guitar makers who are, who come out of like the Quebec area, it seems like there's this tendency towards that, like very artistic um, sort of like, I don't want to say it's like flashy because it's not, it's like, but it's more geometric, very tasteful. And, um, and it seems like it, each of you are very distinct from the other, but there's kind of like a, a cohesion to it, oddly enough. And so, and it's so different from, you know, like the more American, like traditional, you know, herringbone or people who are doing like more nature-y looking rosettes or something like that. It's, there's like this sort of like, like, I guess elevated is my, my go-to word for it. Cause it's very, it just seems very refined to me. And so can you tell me more about like how you ended up with your specific sort of aesthetic style? Well, uh, in cabinet making and uh, at the Luthery School in Quebec City, we had uh, many classes about arts and uh, different movements and everything. And that really helped me with figuring out what I like and what I didn't like uh, in, uh, in history. And I really fell in love with the hard deco uh, movement, mm -hmm. which really, I think really appears in the, in the inlays I, I use on my instrument. I love all the squares line, very geometrical, as you said, and uh, yeah, kind of, uh, uh, sometimes I think I love too much doing meters and <laughs> I have to stop myself uh, doing, doing some because I could spend uh, way too much time on a rosette just Mm -hmm. adding meters and uh, everything but yeah I, I love all this uh, geometric and uh, symmetrical I stopped to add some asymmetrical yeah. design in, uh, in my in my guitars now but uh, yeah I love the, the this um, 
this contrast it gives with the all the organic shape of the of the guitar really kind of clashes with it and very uh very liney very angular so yeah yeah i think that's a good way to describe it it's got it feels very i guess almost like northern because i guess like brian gallup kind of does similar things with his guitars so maybe it's maybe it's like a northerly thing but yeah that art deco influence i think just goes so nicely on guitars Aside from these two, do you tend to go for um, sort of your own approach on the classic designs, like kind of trying to get from like the parlor size to the jumbos, or do you have do you kind of narrow it a little bit down further? Well, actually, for the acoustic guitars, these are the two models I built: so the Grand Auditorium and the, the OM model. The Grand Auditorium, I designed it um, while I was still uh, I, I had the first draft for the shape when I was still uh, in class at the National Rookie School and restarted using the, not using, but inspiring the lines of Kraut, uh, Raymond Kraut, mm -hmm. uh, which I was, I love the work and trying to have a very organic instrument. So with rounded shoulders and narrow, narrow shoulders too. So yeah, I started with that uh, for the Grand Auditorium. So a bit more, let's say, contemporary. For the OM model, I started with the, the classic Martin model, the, the OM, but I wasn't a huge fan of the flat top and bottom. So I just redraw the shape to have a more, still more organic. I, I think I, I love this word for, <laughs> for <laughs> designing a shape in a guitar, but yeah, more organic with rounded top and uh, not a, a too flat bottom. So I feel like it's, that... Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry, it's kind of a, a mix in between tradition for the OM and more contemporary for uh, the Grand Auditorium. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, I feel like I feel like that more rounded shape, maybe that's what gives it so much more volume. Like I know Jeff Jewett, he just brought us a, a double O, but he really rounded out the bottom. So it doesn't have that sort of boxy double O look. And it, it sounds more like an OM, like that was kind of his goal was to get that OM sound in the, o, the double O body. And so I wonder if that just that, a little bit of extra like room in the body or something maybe get, like really adds to the voice a lot. Do you think that's probably the case? That might be the case actually. It's always surprising how, uh, a very tiny change in the shape of an instrument can make the the volume of the air contained in the box vary a lot because of the because of the the volume of it and the the, the 3d aspect of, a, of an instrument uh, re re changes a lot and end up uh, changing a lot about the tone the response and the volume of the of the guitar in the end yeah yeah definitely cool um, well, do you do, do you work with dealers like us very often, or do you do a lot of just custom orders directly for players? Uh, mostly custom orders. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a, a shop here in Quebec City where I have some instruments uh, as uh, demonstrations. But uh, yeah, mostly custom orders or for uh, custom, custom builds for shows uh, mm -hmm. to present. Yeah. Do you find that people try out your instrument at shows or in this shop and then eventually you're like actually can i just directly order one from you because I, I want this this and that <laughs> yeah yeah uh, actually that's most of the of the of the way it goes i feel like it's like people you you present what you what you feel comfortable doing and uh, not only uh, on the sound but also aesthetically so okay. people know what you can do with this design, but also how your instrument will sound because we both are our own signatures. Mm -hmm. And then people decide with a, a discussion. It's, a, it's always a discussion with the musician to guide them through what they want, what they need, and sometimes help them figure out that what they want or what they need is not what they want. Mm -hmm. 
yeah so it's a uh, it's always a, a discussion it's a uh, it's a it, I, I love the, the the discussion with the client to help them figure out where they are going with a mm -hmm. custom build yeah how do you direct that conversation like do you what do you ask people to sort of do to give you an idea of what they want because it's so hard to describe tone so like what what are what are your ways to like kind of suss out what they're really after oh yeah uh yeah that that's the tricky part of the job sometimes <laughs> trying to translate the, the 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 word the musician uses as mm -hmm. he how he feels the sound compared to how you feel it and how you express it yeah but first i try to figure out what he plays, how he plays it, uh, what kind of music. And then usually you can narrow down to a more clear and simple vocabulary once you figure out what the, the musician what the musician is about and what he what he will play and how he he approach the his, his playing and his music. So does he play loud? Does he play mellow? Is he uh, jazzy or more finger style and so yeah, yeah. first I, I try to i try to listen first before talking and and uh, and heading towards something I, I i try to listen the the the, the needs and the, the the person i have in front of me to to figure out his needs mm -hmm. awesome um well is there any tone wood that you feel like people should explore a little bit more that maybe they're not really giving enough credit to or that is maybe newer and not as uh not as well known in terms of what people will be more familiar with well there are a lot of woods and many people have their reason which mostly are good to use woods uh i personally discovered um the glass fur a few years ago mm -hmm. and the glass fur is not very used uh, in guitar making uh, but going through time if it's very old dried it gets incredible and one of the best guitars i made was wow. in the glass fur uh amazing wood i i supplied from a, a guy in pennsylvania with this wood which is a funny story it was the floor of the gymnasium he was a teacher <laughs> there and mm -hmm. the gym gymnasium was uh rebuilt so they tear it down but it was the floor for 50 years Mm -hmm. and it was huge slab so the, the guy who is a, a guitar a guitar lover not a guitar maker but a guitar lover just selected the the quarter stone slabs resold them to make tops and it was dry at least for 50 years yeah and it's an amazing wood sounds oh. incredible like a bell for yeah. deep basses and very responsive so yeah i love this wood but you have to to find the, the the right the right piece of wood to work with it because it might not be as responsive it's if it's not dry enough mm -hmm. but yeah the glass fur is one of my unknown wood uh, i love yeah i think that's the first you're the first person i've heard say they've worked with douglas fur that's really interesting so it, you said it's a top wood it's kind of like spruce. yeah, yeah. Top wood. Um, uh, it's it's kind of it sounds like like Sitka spruce, but gets lighter than Sit Sitka spruce okay. as long as it dries. So mm -hmm. very nice. Mm, interesting. What did you pair it with on when you built the guitar out of it? Uh, it was an Indian rosewood back inside on a Noem model, and yeah, the the the, the sustain was incredible, and the 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 the, the, the bass respond like uh, it, it was so balanced, but very very reactive and present and mm -hmm. oh cool did you sell it to someone or do you do you still have it uh no i, I went to ontario a few years ago now but yeah cool unfortunately don't don't have it anymore but somebody is happy with it i i think yeah that's good <laughs> um so what if you were to build your own perfect guitar and i feel like every luthier is always like oh, i always end up selling all of them but if you had the chance to build your perfect guitar and not sell it you couldn't sell it what would you build for yourself i've uh, i built myself a uh, grand auditorium which is a model i personally really really love uh, a few years ago and if I was to build one again, I would still go with the Grand Auditorium. Uh, I would go with the Glass Fur for sure for the top. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, in general, we'll back inside. Always, uh, I feel it's a, it's a very nice combo mm -hmm. and sound port for sure. Mm -hmm. 
uh, armrest too. Well, actually, it's kind of the guitar I built for myself a few years ago, but different woods. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> So yeah, so Douglas fir, Indian rosewood. Gotta gotta get the word out on that a little bit more. Indian rosewood. I feel like I've been talking about this with everybody too. It's a little bit underrated right now. So gotta yeah, go un unknown and the underrated. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, really deserve to 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 be more considered because it's well, it's a, it's a classic. Let's say uh, Indian rosewood. Uh, you can't go wrong picking Indian rosewood. Yeah. Yeah, there's a reason why it, why it is the classic that it is. Um, so I guess before we wrap up, uh, do you have anything else that you wanted to promote specifically, or are you going to be at any of the guitar shows this year where, where people can expect to see you? I'll be in the Fretboard Summit in Chicago uh, by the end of uh, August this year. So this is the last show for this year. Next year, hoping to, I really hope to be able to go back to uh, La Conner. Mm -hmm. went there uh, this year and this is one of my favorite show yeah uh, am amazing crowd amazing yeah. team uh making up making it up uh, together so yeah very yeah. very nice show like on awesome yeah we, we were so disappointed not to go i love that part of uh, like pacific northwest it's so beautiful so oh yeah hopefully next year but um <laughs> well Awesome. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. I'm, we're so excited to have your guitars in the shop and we'll, we'll do a big release of this, this, uh, this podcast as soon as we get the guitars demoed and we can sort of splice everything in and make it really, uh, make it really exciting. So, um, but yeah, thank you so much for thinking of us and sending guitars our way. Thank you. Thank you to you for the amazing work and making it so easy to, to work with you. <laughs>